So my, my lecture today is going to be on this rather unusual topic, which is, is there a connection between scientific talent and autism? So before I start, I'd like to just um, acknowledge that the work I'm going to present is the result of collaboration with uh, a large set of scientists, mostly based in Cambridge in England. Uh, you can see that there's a group of scientists working on the role of hormones, and I'm going to be saying quite a lot about research into hormonal factors. Uh, a group of research researchers looking at the psychology of autism, but also the relationship with scientific talent. And finally, some researchers who are looking at brain scanning using MRI. Okay, so just to um, remind you about the background, we're talking about autism spectrum conditions, where the features, the diagnostic features, are social and communication problems alongside of narrow interests, sometimes called obsessions, and repetitive behavior. Now, what's very interesting is that whereas the first set of features, social and communication difficulties, we would all recognize to be symptoms, if you will, of a condition, the second set of features, the narrow interests or obsessions, need not necessarily be thought of as difficulties. Typically, we do, we do think of them as symptoms, but part of what I'm going to be arguing today is that that second set of features may not be a problem, may actually be an area of strength. So when we use the term obsession, that could simply be the clinical way that we're actually describing areas of strong interest, which could lead to expertise. Now, we know that there are two major subgroups on the autistic spectrum. One is classic autism, the other is Asperger's syndrome. What I've shown you on this slide is that there's a very marked sex difference in the rates of, of people getting a diagnosis. In classic autism, about four males for every one female. In Asperger's syndrome, about nine males for every one female. And that's partly why I'm going to be looking at the role of hormones and uh, genetics in thinking about this sex ratio. Okay, so now to the, the theme for this presentation about scientific talent and autism. Why would we put these two things side by side? They don't seem to belong together. But if you go back to the original account by Hans Asperger in 1944. So he was the pediatrician whose name has now been given to one of those subgroups. And he was working in Vienna, in Austria. He wrote in German, this is the translation, that for success in science, a dash of autism is essential. I think you're, are you just figuring out the sound there? Because it sounds like we're getting a slight distortion. Okay, thank you. Um, so he said, a dash of autism is essential. It's a very interesting idea. that He was arguing that people who succeed in science might need to have a degree of autism. And he went on to say the necessary ingredient may be an ability to turn away from the everyday world with all abilities canalized into one speciality. So this was his word. Um, See if I can pick it out for you. Canalized. It wasn't like channeled, exactly. It wasn't a word that I'd come across before, but I like the word a lot. Um, suggesting that some people who make a great contribution in the world of science might specialize or channel all of their intellectual effort into one very small area. Clinically, we might think of deep, narrow interests as obsessions, but in the world of science, that could actually be um, an academic contribution. So how can we test for this idea that there might be a link between scientific talent and autism? Well, in this slide, I'm showing you what we might call the anecdotal approach, that if you look at people with Asperger's syndrome, often their so-called obsessions, 
have a very scientific quality. So in this slide, what we see is a Xerox of uh, somebody's notebooks. Uh, this young man with Asperger's syndrome fills his notebooks with information about the weather. He goes out at midnight every night into his garden and he systematically records information about the weather. He doesn't do this for professional reasons, he does it because he's interested in the weather. And you can see that in the first column he's got the month and the date, and in the other columns across the page he's recording rainfall, temperature, and uh, maximum and min minimum values and so forth. And his house is literally crammed full of notebooks with this kind of information. Now one way to look at this very anecdotally is to say that he's being very scientific in his area of interest. That although he has a diagnosis of Asperger's syndrome, this little notebook is almost like a window into how his mind works, which is that he likes to organize information in a very systematic, structured way, much like a scientist, except he's not doing it professionally. He's doing it for his own leisure. That's, that's simply how he chooses to think and spend his time. Obviously, the anecdotal approach is very limited. It's not going to help us answer the question, is there a link between autism and scientific talent? Because in each case like this, all we have is, is anecdotal information. Here's a, a second approach. This, was, this is the front page of an article that was published in 2003. I don't expect you to be able to read it from your distance, but it was published in the journal of the Royal Society of Medicine in England by uh, a man called Ian James, and the title of his paper is Singular Scientists. And what he does in this paper is he presents biographies of very famous scientists who he thinks today would be diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome. And if I flip to the next slide, you can see the six scientists that he picks out. So you'll recognize these names. Isaac Newton and Henry Cavendish are the early physicists that he was um, picking out, that from their biographies, they seem to fit the profile of Asperger's syndrome. Obviously, Isaac Newton is famous for many things, amongst which was his discovery of gravity. Henry Cavendish is known to be um, the person who discovered hydrogen. Then he also goes on to pick out more recent scientists from the 20th century, Albert Einstein, who got the Nobel Prize for, amongst other things, his work on relativity. Marie Curie, who in 1911 got the Nobel Prize in in uh, chemistry for isolating radium. Her daughter, Irene Joliot Curie, who also got a Nobel Prize, 1935, for her work in nuclear fission. And finally, a physicist, Paul Dirac, who got the prize, the Nobel Prize, for his work in quantum mechanics. James argues that all six of these very distinguished world-class scientists would all have met the criteria for Asperger's syndrome if you looked at their lives. And just to take one of those examples, I don't have time to go through all six, but you can see in the case of Albert Einstein, if you looked at his childhood, he's described as being alone, having no friends, and not being interested in mixing and socializing. Apparently he was late to talk language development, language delay. Apocryphally, he didn't speak until he was five years old. And even then, when he did start to speak, his speech showed echolalia. And as an adult, um, and a dis distinguished scientist, he said, I do not socialize because um, that would distract me from my work, and I really only live for that. So he wanted to be away from people and to really focus some people would say obsessionally, on the world of physics. And he also had a strong interest in music when he wasn't doing physics. And he said, music is a way for me to be independent of people. So you can see that this was a man who didn't, didn't want to spend time socializing and instead wanted to focus 
on physics and music. Now, this biographical approach is very interesting, but as you can see in the bottom of this slide, I've suggested that this might be a very unreliable way to approach the question because biographies are always um, fragmented. We only have partial information about what the person was like, information which has survived historically. The person isn't here to speak up for themselves, so we don't really know whether if we saw them today alive, would they meet the criteria for autism or Asperger's syndrome. But certainly it's pointing at this connection between great scientific talent and autism or Asperger's. But what we really need is a different approach to test if there's a link.